good? All right, good morning. Sorry, good morning. <laughs> um, if you would, open your, uh, your book, your, your tactics book, to page 72. We're going to get to that uh, here in a minute. I want to start by uh, doing a little bit of review. So as you know, this summer we've been sort of piggybacking on the um, evangelism training stuff that we did uh, starting in January through the winter and early spring. And um, we're piggybacking that by looking at the, the content related to the tactics book. And uh, the, the subtitle is A Game Plan for Discussing Your Christian Convictions. Um, it's interesting that these, these videos are kind of starting to circulate a little bit on the internet. And I've had a couple of people write me asking about the, the material that we're using for this and uh, showing some interest. These are, these are grace-believing folks, uh, folks who rightly divide and so forth. And, showing some interest in, um, in, in sort of the approach that we're taking to some of this and have expressed interest in maybe trying to, to do something similar with, uh, with some of their saints in those assemblies. So I've been trying to you know, answer their questions and encourage them along those lines. So this is our fourth study in this. And so far what we've seen, and, and every time I'm trying to condense this or make this look just a little bit different, we discussed the difference between strategy and tactics. Um, we did that the first. We did that the first week. We talked about uh, that, and then last week I hit heavy this idea of moving from content to conversation. Okay, moving from just gathering doctrine, gathering information, which obviously is very, very important, but then moving with that into conversation and engagement with other people around that, whether that be the issue of the gospel itself and issues of salvation and justification and so forth or whether that be issues of edification and establishment in sound doctrine uh, for believers so we've talked about that then we've we I should say Kukul has laid out in the material in, in the tactics book the fundamental game plan the fundamental tactical game plan for engaging people in conversation and moving from content to conversation and the game plan that he has identified that we've seen so far, we've looked at the first two steps. The first step is to gather information, okay? To gather information from somebody about where they're at, what they're thinking, why they're thinking those things. And that took its form in the STEM question of what do you mean by that, okay? So that would be a question that you would ask somebody as they're uh, engaging in conversation with you and they say something that you're not sure about or you want more information, you can ask them what do you mean by that or some form of that question as the first part of the tactical game plan that he's establishing here that he's called the Colombo tactic. So using Col Colombo tactic number one to gather information reveals what people think. Okay, What is it that they think? What is it that they're thinking? Um, and that's often an important thing to clarify before you go any further with somebody, okay? Um, I encountered a situation this week where uh, there was some discussion regarding the King James Bible, and the issue of the word perfect came up, okay? So one of the first things that I did is I said, well, what do you mean by perfect? When you say it's perfect, what do you mean by that, okay? Because we had to establish some common ground about how we were using that terminology, right? Because that person might have been using it differently than the way I was using it or something. And we just had to work through that, right? So asking the tactical question, number one, to gather information reveals what somebody thinks. Okay, so we, we've been over that. Second, last week we saw the issue of reversing the burden of proof. That is, keeping the burden of proof on the party or on the individual that actually is bearing the burden, okay? And that took the form of the STEM question of how did you come to that conclusion, okay? Asking them this reveals how they think. This reveals what they think. The first question, how, uh, what do you mean by that? The second question, how did you come to that conclusion, is revealing the process, the thought process, the methodology that they're using to get to that or, or to arrive at that conclusion, whatever it might be, okay? Now, what he's going to do, what we're going to see today as we kind of go the next step with this, is he's going to say that if you're paying attention to what they, how they answer these questions and revealing of how they think, they will no doubt almost inevitably manifest some sort of flaw or some sort of, or maybe they don't know why they think what they think at all, 
but that's the that's the, the second step to the uh, in the tactical approach so it's reversing the burden of proof and this was sort of the rule that he gave and we had some discussion about this last time whoever makes the claim bears the burden of proof okay so if I'm gonna claim that um, you know, I, I don't know, any, any crazy thing, if I'm going to make the claim, then according to uh, Kukul's uh, tactical approach, the one that makes the claim is going to bear the burden, right? So if I'm going to claim that, you know, chemtrails are poisoning the atmosphere, for example, just to grab a random thing that I saw a lot of discussion on, if I'm going to make that claim, then who's going to bear the burden of proof? Well, I should, according to the tactical approach established or outlined by Kukul, okay? So the rule of thumb with this is whoever's making the claim bears the burden of proof, okay? Now, we also get, he also gave us some cautions here last, last time. He said, anytime you hear somebody say, I can explain that, that basically is a signal to you that it's going to be story time, okay? That they're going to tell you some story, some tale, to try to you know uh, justify or explain why they think that and we started our class last time by looking at a bunch of verses in the Paul in, in the uh, pastoral epistles where Paul warns against fables and stories and people that are gonna just you know uh, spin you tales and so forth and not really give you any any answers okay so it's not our job to refute someone's story okay and the other thing that he said that I forgot to write up there is an alternative explanation is not necessarily an argument. Okay? An alternative explanation is not necessarily an argument. So it's not our job to refute stories. In fact, the scriptures, specifically the Apostle Paul, warn against uh, giving heed to this kind of thing. Okay? And then we came over here and we saw the idea of staying out of the hot seat, right? And here he warned against the professor's ploy. And the professor's ploy is where you are in a situation, and he used the, the, the example of being in a college class, and the professor issues forth some challenge about Christianity or about the Bible or so on and so forth, and he says, don't fall into the trap of, of, of thinking that it's your job to answer the professor, right? That's his classroom, he's got the mic, and it's probably not going to go very well for you if you if you do that right so he warns against that he says don't make a full don't make a don't make a frontal assault against an enemy in an entrenched position right that professor is baiting you okay i know that's true it's happened to me and i told you a story no, a story okay i gave you an illustration about how I, I had an experience early on in college that went very badly for me uh, along those lines and how I changed the way that I was going to approach those things later on. But then he also talks about switching when you, when you feel like the, the conversation is going in a particular way that's not going to be favorable to you. He talks about switching from persuasion to fact-finding mode. Okay. So instead of continuing down a road with somebody that you're unsure of, that you don't know about, that you feel that they have more information regarding, okay, that there's nothing wrong with switching from persuasion mode to fact-finding mode, and the magic words to do that are simply, let me think about that, okay? And we talked about that gives you time, then you can go on your own time, you can go home, you can go to the library, or wherever it is that you study or gather information, you can go home and read your Bible, obviously, um, if you need to get other information so that you can uh, get back or, or you know, get a better grounding or foothold on that material so that then you can go back and say, hey, you know, um, we, last time we talked, you said this, and I said that I was going to think about that. I have thought about that, and you know, here's what I've, here's what I've found. You know, how, how do you respond to that or what, however you want to handle that, right? So all this is review of the basic uh, tactical approach of the Colombo tactic that he's laying out in the, first five, in the first six chapters of the book and in the first three uh, audio lessons, okay? So let me share with you something he's got here in the uh, curriculum study guide that goes with the video. In a cutout called ambassador's skills he says when someone's cherished view is at stake it's not unusual 
for him or her to raise empty objections. Okay, let me read that again. When someone's cherished view is at stake, it's not unusual for him or her to raise empty objections. Now, I don't know if your experience has been the same as mine, but when you start talking to somebody, I'm just going to use the Bible example as one because it's an easy one. When you start talking about the superiority of the King James Bible in English with somebody that does not already have that belief or persuasion, and they will almost every time in my dealing with people, they will immediately feel like you're what? Attacking, attacking them, right? They will almost immediately feel like you're, 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 you're attacking them, that you're somehow putting down the Bible that they're using, or something along those lines, okay? And the, the rule here, or the, the statement is, when someone's cherished view is at stake, okay, it is not unusual for him or her to raise empty objections. Objections that initially sound worthwhile, but simply can't be defended once examined. Probing with questions, Columbo style, often reveals the lack of substance behind the bluster, like the emperor and his new clothes. All it takes is one person to say, you're naked, and the game is up. Okay? So in other words, if I'm a Christian, why would I even want to entertain the view that there are mistakes and errors in the Bible? How does it help me as a believer to defend my position to entertain that view? It doesn't, right? But you know that there are people, many, a great many people, that think that they cannot get their hands on a Bible that is inerrant today. That it's in the lost original or that it's somewhere else or, or so on and so forth, right? And this is, this is their view. Um, or they will even go so far as to say that, you know, there's factual mistakes or something along those lines, right? And when you come, at, when you come in a, into a conversation with them and they perceive that you're maybe arguing for why the, the King James is better or what have you than what they're using, they're going to get defensive and that's kind of the way it goes, okay? And that's because you are putting in jeopardy in their mind something that they is very personal to them, something that is very sort of cherished to them and so forth, and so they're going to not necessarily just let that go, okay? So I think, he makes, I think he makes some good points here along those lines. If you would, look, let's go to the book here. I want to set up where we're going next with this on page 72. <laughs> I'm on page 72, first paragraph at the top of the page. It says, up until now, we've talked about using the Colombo tactic in a very particular way. We have been using friendly questions to gather two types of information. Number one, a person's view and his reasons for it. One of the advantages of this approach, as we noted, was that it is, large, it is largely a passive enterprise. We put nothing on the line. Since there is nothing for us, defend, for us to defend, there is no pressure. By contrast, the third use of Colombo takes, takes us more on the offensive, yet in an inoffensive way. We ask a different kind of question, sometimes called a leading question. As the name suggests, leading questions take the person in the direction that we want them to go. Think of yourself as an archer shooting at a target. Questions are your arrows. Your target will be different in different situations. Sometimes your goal will be to defeat what you think is a bad argument or a flawed point of view. Your question will be aimed at that purpose. Or you may want to use questions to indirectly explain or advance your own ideas. Sometimes you will, you will set up the terms of the conversation using questions to put you on a more beneficial position for your next move. In each of these cases, questions accomplish two things that mere statements cannot. Every time you ask a question and get a favorable response, a person is telling you that he understands the point you're making and agrees with it, at least provisionally. He takes another step forward with you in the thinking process. Now, let's stop there for a minute. If you've been around the assembly for any length of time and you've heard me talk in Right Division 101 presentations, one thing that I have said in the past, I don't remember if I said it in the recent one we did here last month, but I've said, if, you know, if somebody is following you, you can take them out into the lake pretty far. And if they're with you and then you all of a sudden you do something that they feel takes their oars away, they're either going to have to revise their opinion 
or go all the way back to the beginning and say that everything that they've agreed to is now what? Wrong. Wrong. Okay? So that's kind of what he's getting at here when he's talking about using questions to move the person along in a sort of an incremental way as you're, as you're getting them to see the case. Now, now look folks, have we seen Paul do this in our study of 1 Corinthians? Paul will say to the Corinthians things and he'll put it in the form of a question, right? And then he'll sort of answer the question. And then after he answers that question, then he'll ask him what? Another question. And then he'll answer that question and then Paul will pose another what? Another question. Now obviously that's God the Holy Spirit through Paul writing those things in, in 1 Corinthians and so forth. But there's, a, there's an approach there that works as far as getting people to see things, right? And this is kind of what he's getting at. So let's just finish that section, top of page 73. Ultimately, we want to win someone over to our point of view. But we don't want to force our opinions. Instead, we want to persuade. When the steps to a conclusion are both clear and reasonable, it is much easier to convince somebody because he can see the route clearly. Okay? He can even retrace, he can even retrace it on his own if he wants to. With each question, we lead him closer towards our destination. In this way, we bring him along on the journey. Now look at what he says there in the uh, like cutout section. He says, when you get approvals for each successive link in the process of reasoning, you move the conversation in the direction you have in mind. In that way, you carefully guide the other person to your conclusion. There are a, there excuse me there are helpful ways to use this third use there are helpful ways that this third use of Colombo can work. Generally, your leading questions will be will be used to inform, persuade, set up the terms, or refute. Okay. Now let me show you how this tactic plays out in specific examples. So before we look at those, I have a few sort of practice ones here. Okay. So let me go back to the the course notes here. So, see if you can uncover the flaws in the common challenges below. Then suggest a question that begins to address the underlying flaw. Okay? So, here's the first one. So, if somebody says to you the following, you shouldn't push your morality on me. You shouldn't push your morality on me. How, how might you use a Colombo approach to respond to that assertion? Okay, what do I mean by what? Okay. <clears throat> so you could do that and, and get to the bottom of what the person means by morality. To start. to start, right, I agree. Any other thoughts on that one? Does that person making this statement have any thoughts on morality? Yeah, you'd assume so, right? Okay. So another thing you could do is say, well, according to you, according to your viewpoint, what would I have to do to be moral? Now, what have you? Let's say you ask that question. What have you just done? You have shifted the burden somewhat, and you're drawing them out, right? And you're drawing them out in a particular way. What particular way are you drawing them out? Correct. So they, they're, they're fundamentally saying you shouldn't push your morality on me, but do they want you to agree with their morality? So in order for you to agree with their morality, you're going to have to say you're wrong and they're what? And they're right. Okay. So you, you, these statements are often loaded. How about this one? You're intolerant and arrogant. Yes. <laughs> You're intolerant and arrogant. Okay? Yeah. Well, he's got... There's an interesting thing. I didn't read it last time because we ran out of time. Okay? So on page 60, he says this about the issue of the, the tolerant issue. Okay? He says, If you're placed in a situation where you suspect your convictions will be labeled intolerant, narrow-minded, or judgmental, turn the tables. When someone asks... 
for your personal views about a moral issue. So maybe same-sex marriage or something like that, okay? Preface your remarks with a question. Say, you know, that is actually a very personal question you're asking, and I'd be glad to answer. But before I do, I want to know if you consider yourself to be a tolerant person. Okay, so if you take that tactical approach, what have you just done? Now, what do you think? Are the ch if, if I ask somebody, do you consider yourself to be a tolerant person, how many of them are going to say, no, not me. Uh, I'm, I'm the most intolerant guy you'll ever meet. Most of them are going to say what? Yeah. Yes, I do consider myself to be a tolerant person. Okay? So let me start over. But before, we, but before we do, I want to know if you consider yourself to be a tolerant person. Is it safe to give my opinion, or are you going to judge me for my point of view? Do you respect diverse points of view, or do you, do, or do you condemn others for convictions that differ from yours? If they tell you they're tolerant, then when you give your point of view, it's going to be very difficult for them to find fault with you without looking guilty as well. Okay, now that is, again, that's a tactical maneuver in conversation that if the issue of tolerance comes up, you can simply say, well, you know, you ask an interesting question, okay? Do you consider yourself, before I answer, I'd like to give you my opinion, but before I do, do you consider yourself to be a tolerant person? Oh, yes, I'm a very tolerant person, very, very tolerant. Okay, well, if it's safe for me, then I'll give you my opinion. If they agree to all that, and then you tell them your opinion, and then they still, like, get mad at you, that, that's not going to go real well for them, right? Especially if other people are what? Listening, okay? So, so let's just do one more. The miracles in the Bible, the miracles in the Bible prove it's a myth. The miracle, so somebody, what would you, how might you use Columbo, the strategies here, to, to deal with the person that says, the miracles in the Bible prove it's a myth. How did you come to that conclusion? Okay. That's an easy answer, right, Ernie? And then they're going to have to do some explaining, and in explaining, will it reveal how they think about the Bible pertaining to it? Okay. Anybody else? What's that? Were you there? <laughs> Were you okay? So, I think at this point it makes sense. We've kind of reviewed some things. I've, I've sort of tried to introduce you my, my own this this third use of Columbo. So I think we should go to the video. And as always, there's a couple times where I'm going to stop it, probably make some comments, get, uh, get some feedback from you guys about it. Lee, uh, just a comment. Uh, there's a fellow. We watch almost every night on on uh, television a name Tucker, and he uses that same approach in dealing. He brings these guys on that he knows he disagrees with, and he just mutilates them by his questions. He, he uh, basically keeps them from ever giving their opinion on anything because they. He's throws so many questions out there for them. Yeah. Anyway. The, 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 this, this is known, if, if you take a philosophy class, they'll talk about the Socratic method, okay? Uh, the method of so-called, the method of Socrates, his, his teaching method was based upon a question and answer. He would pose a question, the student would devise some sort of an answer, and then he would what? pose another question, right? And so that this, this is not an uncommon methodology that people have u haven't used before. So let's, um, let's look at the first part of this. Hi, Greg Hochul here with Stand to Reason, and this is our third session together, learning the tactical approach. I hope that you had a, a good time in the last couple of weeks, maybe, taking some of the stuff that we've learned and talked about and putting it into play and getting comfortable with it. Uh, let's take a moment and talk about what we discussed last session. Last session, I introduced you to the second use of the Colombo tactic. That would be the second step in our game plan, and I call that reversing the burden of proof. 
Remember the rule that we talked about, the one who makes the claim bears the burden, which means we're not going to let the other side have any free rides. Um, we're not going to let them get away with just making assertions, okay? We want the rationale. The next thing that I taught you was to avoid a kind of a trap I call it the professor's ploy, in which the burden of proof is reversed upon you when you didn't make the claim. And I told you, don't ever allow someone else to make you disprove his or her view. It's their job to defend their own view with their own reasons and evidence first before you have to step up. Okay, and I told you also what to do when you didn't know what to do. Uh, this whole approach, our game plan, is a relaxed game plan. It's a don't push it game plan. It's a gardening game plan. So if you don't know where to go next, don't sweat it. If you don't see an opening, no big deal. Do what you can, let the rest go. There's no need to force the conversation. The last thing that we talked about when we were together uh, last time is I showed you how to use the Colombo tactic defensively to keep you out of the hot seat. So sometimes you're going to find yourself outmatched, somebody else that's drilling you with a lot of extra information you don't know how to handle, go immediately into student mode. Even take notes if you have to. Invite the other person to tell you what they believe and why they believe it. Now you're the learner, you're not trying to persuade. Tell them you'll think about it and then think about it. Work on it on your own when the pressure is off uh, and, and it's just a lot easier to do that. So that's what we talked about last time. Here's what I want to talk about in the third session. I want to complete the game plan, basically. I want to teach you the third step uh, in the Colombo tactic, the third use of Colombo. And that third use is using questions to make a point or using questions to lead someone somewhere. I'm going to show you, in addition to that, some very specific ways that you can improve your use of Colombo and finally, I want to show you how to defend against the Colombo tactic when somebody else uses it with you. So let's talk for a moment about the third step. We talked about the first step of the game plan. All you're going to worry about is gathering information. You're going to use the question, what do you mean by that? The next step, when people make a claim or an assertion, then we reverse the burden of proof on the person who's making the claim. We use the question, now how did you come to that conclusion or, or some version of that? Okay. Um, Here's the third use of Columbo. In the first two uses, by the way, we didn't need to know anything but the questions, and that's why it's such a good game plan. In the third use of Columbo, you gotta know something. If you're gonna use questions to make a point, you gotta know the point that you're going to make. Think of, uh, think of it uh, like, like you have a target, and target is the point you wanna make. The questions that you use are gonna be arrows shooting at the target, so you have to have the target in view. Now, there are two different ways that you can um, use this, two different kinds of targets, I guess, is the best way to put it. You can use questions to advance your own point of view. So let's say you want to make a point. How do you do that? Use the Colombo tactic. We'll talk about how to do that. Secondly, you can use your questions to exploit a weakness or a flaw. That means you can help a person see where he or she went wrong in their thinking. Let me go back just for a moment to something I said a moment ago. In the first two uses of Colombo, you don't need to know anything but the questions. That's the strength of it for beginners. If you want to use uh, Colombo in a more aggressive way, the third use of Colombo, you're going to make a point. You need to know the point you want to make. You need to know, say, the solution to the problem, if there's a problem in view. And uh, let's just say the question is, uh, why is Jesus the only way? So you want to make the case, or at least you want to explain why Jesus is the only way of salvation. So what do you need to know in that one? You need to know why Jesus is the only way of salvation. If you don't know that, then you can't go further. you got to know the answer to the question, but you also have to know how you're going to get there. So there are pieces to this explanation that you need to have in place. Now, let me tell you a secret about the pieces. If you take the pieces and you place them out one after another and, you, that, and they lead to your conclusion, it is going to be very easy for the other person, especially if, if they're a little bit of a kind of aggravated as a skeptic. In other words, they're not playing ball with you very much. They're having a conversation, but they're not, they're not uh, coming along easily. Then they're going to find something wrong with everything that you say. You're going to have to put pieces on the table to get to your conclusion, in this case, how Jesus is the 
or why Jesus is the only way of salvation, uh, but they're not going to let you finish because they're going to start taking exception with the pieces that you put out there to make your case. There's a way around this, and uh, you can call it a trick if you want to. It's tricky, but it's not abusive. And the thing is, is you want to get as much as possible the other person to put the pieces on the table for you. You want to ask the kind of questions that will get them to affirm these pieces that you are going to use eventually to lead to your point. Now, if they're going to affirm those pieces, you can see, can't you, how hard it's going to be for them to take them off the table. They're their points. They've already said yes to them. They can't go back later and deny them. That's a lot uh, a lot more difficult for them to do. So let me show you what I mean, uh, especially with this issue about Jesus being the only way. Uh, one of the first books I wrote was featured at Barnes & Noble, and they had me come in and give a, a presentation for the book. And it's the thing where the author um, talks about the books, answers questions, and then signs some books. Well, somebody had been standing off to the side in, in the uh, maybe the religion section or whatever and had heard some of the things I had to say. So that person came up to me and asked me a question. They said, why do I need to believe in Jesus? I'm Jewish, he said. I, I try to live as best that I can. I believe in God. So why do I need your Jesus? So that's the question, right? It can be phrased lots of different ways, but this is why is Jesus the only way of salvation? So now I need to explain this to him, but I know I need to put some pieces on the table. So I said to him, do you mind if I ask you a couple questions? He said, no, go ahead. I said, here's the question. I said, first question. I said, do you think the people who do bad things ought to be punished? He thought for a moment, and then he said, well, since I'm a prosecuting attorney, yes. <laughs> now, I got lucky in the attorney part. I didn't know that about him. But most people do have this intuition, this deep understanding of justice that people who do bad things ought to pay for them. Okay, so good. People who do bad things ought to pay. I agree with you, I said to him. So we got a piece on the table that he put there, but I agree with it. Okay, great. Second question. Have you ever done any bad things? That's what I asked him. He paused for a moment and then said, well, yeah, I guess I have. Now, if he would have said he's never done any bad things, I would have said, uh, can I talk to your wife? Everybody's done bad things. We all know this. And he was just being honest with me. Okay, fine. There's another piece on the table. I said, I agree with you. I said, now, do you know where we've gotten here? Look where we've come in just two questions. This is what I said to him. I said, we both believe that people who do bad things ought to be punished, and we both believe that we've done those things. Do you know what I call that? I asked him. He said, what? I said, I call that bad news. <laughs> now, you think about it for a moment. Do I have to tell this man that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that he's a sinner, I guess? He said, no, he, he's already told me. Do I have to tell him that he's under judgment? No, he's already told me. Now, he, 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 he doesn't know where I'm going with this. Uh, he wasn't thinking about that when he walked into the Barnes & Noble. But because I asked him a very specific question that had a very straightforward, reasonable, understandable response, he gave it to me. Now I got this stuff on the table. And I told him, well, it's like you and I are both standing in the dock. And the judge, God, is there ready to deliver sentence on us. And we know we deserve it. And then God pauses and he says, hey, fellas, do either of you care about a, a pardon right now? Are you interested in clemency right now? I want you to see what just happened there, friend. What I did was I, I gathered some things that were things that he already knew. They're built into him. And now I'm using them to help him feel the force of the problem so he can feel the force of the solution. He and I are both in trouble. God is offering a way out. So what's the way out? The way out is that God became a man himself and initiated a rescue operation, living the life that we should have lived and then getting in the docket for us so that he could take the punishment that we deserve. That's what I explained to him. I think I might have said something about Jesus taking the rap for our crimes against God. Notice the language I'm using. Why am I talking like that? Well, because he's an attorney. This is his language. It's also biblical language. 
The reason that Jesus is the only way is because he's the only one to solve the problem. Either he sits, stands in the dock and gets our punishment, or we take our own punishment. That's it. If we say yes to Jesus, we're forgiven. If we say no to Jesus, then we get what we deserve to get. So there's the full expanded explanation. But do you see how I got there? I knew the explanation. I understood the problem. And I was able to explain it to somebody in non-religious terms. But what did I do to get there? I used some questions to get some important pieces on the table before I could move forward with my argument. So, now you're beginning to... So, I'm just curious, does anybody have any uh, thoughts or comments about what he, how he just handled that? Do you remember a few weeks, months back now, I guess, we were talking about mastering the critical issues of the gospel? Remember that? And we talked about how you ha uh, there's three things you have to understand. You have to understand that man is a sinner, right? And that as a sinner, he is under the wrath. He's got God's wrath abiding upon him, right? You have to understand, number two, that the solution for that, it, God's solution for that is the cross, right? That's the only solution God provided for human sin. And number three, that it's, it's by trusting and relying exclusively on that that a person receives eternal life as a free gift, right? So you, you know, so that that's... That's this, right? That's your content. You know that. What he's talking about with this, what the illustration that he's using with this guy is by getting him to agree. Oh, do you think that people that do bad things should be punished? Oh, yeah, I think that. Have you ever done anything bad? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, now has the guy agreed to some pretty important stuff without him telling him? So when he, when he said, I don't have to tell him he's a sinner, he's telling me he's a sinner. When he, when he does that, the force, of your, the force of your argument now is now better if he agrees with that. Okay? Now you, you don't have to convince him of that because he's already said, oh, I agree with that. Okay? Was your hand up, Doug? Maybe I confuse you with Kim. Go ahead, Kim. I think you made a great... Unfortunately, um, I think there's lots of people out there that have an alternative reality. So even though you present the gospel very clear that, and they agree that they're we're sinners and done bad things, they still see they don't see the need for a savior. They see the need of judicial error and criminal power. Where you know, I, I live a really bad life, and now I'm doing all this. Better make it worth it. Earn this, yeah. So they have something like a this is somehow worth that alternative reality to the fear of sin. Right. And I think so he didn't he didn't encounter that specifically there, but if you did, then you just go into your you already know from mastering the critical issues of the gospel that turning over a new leaf, you know, turning from sin, doing this, doing that isn't gonna save you. The person needs to understand that trusting and relying exclusively on what Christ did, right? So then you can go into you know, some other, some other form of questioning. I've used this illustration before, but it seems to make sense to bring it up here. In my philosophy class at school, one of the questions I ask every semester is, there's kids in the class, there's always kids in the class that will raise their hand and say they're a Christian. And I will ask them specifically, I will say to them, okay, how do you, how do you know you're a Christian? Why are you a Christian? How do you get to heaven? And every time, well, I do this, and I do that, and I didn't do this, and I didn't do that, and I try to be good, and I think, God, if I'm good, God will let me in. Every time. And what's also interesting is every time, there's always been that one kid who will say, I don't, Mr. Ross, I don't agree. And I'll say, do all you Christians agree with that? And some kid will say, no, I don't. I don't think I can earn my way into heaven. Now, I haven't had it yet where not one kid didn't say that. And I always know what church those kids come from in the town, by the way, okay? But I won't get into that on the video. 
But I figured it out what church is teaching the, a clear, at least a clear gospel to their young people. Okay? But anyway, so I say, well, what do you mean you don't agree with that? He's like, well, I, I don't think, if, I think that if I could earn my own salvation, that Jesus didn't have to die for my sin, or they'll say something along those lines. And then that gives me an opportunity then to respond to that, right? Okay? And I'll say to them, I think, and I'll say, it's my personal, private, subjective opinion that the justice of God is obligated to give eternal life to anyone who has perfect righteousness. And I stop. And they think about it, and every time a kid raises their hand, and they'll say, well, no one has that. I'm like, I agree. They don't. That's why, that's why Christ had to die for your sin. Okay? So again, that, that's, that's, a, that's a different approach than just standing up there and me saying to the class, all right, everyone open up to Romans 3. Everyone, everyone open up to Romans 3. If you can't find it, have somebody next to you find it for you. Okay, And I'm going to teach you Romans 3. Now, how long would that last, do you think? Not long. Okay, But can I still make the same point? Can I still get the same force across taking a different approach? Okay? That's what he's getting at. Anyone else want to comment or respond to that? What he, what he just said. I like what he says. Get the other person to affirm the pieces. If they affirm the pieces and they're with you on this piece and this piece and this piece, and then you get to the big enchilada at the end, they're either going to have to eat it or go all the way back to what? The beginning. Okay? And it's better to have them affirm for themselves that they agree than for you to just just be relying on them telling you. Now, I'm not saying that's inappropriate. I'm just saying if you can get them to do this, that's, that's, that's going to have more force for that person. Okay? Anyone else? Okay. If you want to go an advanced and more effective way of using Columbo, you, you've got to know some things. You've got to know answers to challenges. You've got to know some arguments. And you're going to get that by reading or listening or uh, talking with other Christians. However you get it, it doesn't matter. Once you get it, you want to know how you can express it in a way that others can understand it. And then as much as possible, you want to get the pieces that you need on the table by asking questions. The questions are really critical. Even though you're making a point, it keeps them engaged. Okay. Now let's take another example. Um, somebody at a session, Q&A session, once asked, or actually said, give me, um, oh, the way he put it was, prove to me that God exists. Prove to me God exists. Now, that kind of put me on the spot. I'm there answering questions. I'm the apologist, and somebody says, prove to me God exists. It's kind of like saying you're a comedian, and somebody says, okay, be funny, like right now. Well, here's what I said to him. I said, before we go any further, I've got, to, I've got to repair some problem that are in your challenge. What's that? Well, you said prove. I don't know what you would count as evidence. And unless I have an idea of what would count as evidence to you, there's no sense in me giving anything that I think is a proof. And this is something you ought to keep in mind too, friends. This is, if you here have somebody say, prove this or that, and you don't solve this problem, you can put evidence before them all day long, and they can just simply say, that's not what? Proof, okay? So you, you got to clear that up. The second thing I pointed out to him is you said, prove to me. So you, you want me to give you a line of thinking that is so powerful that it will even convert you. Well, I don't know what your barriers are, what your objections are, what are the kinds of things that would resonate with you. So I asked him, can you put it, uh, the challenge in a little different way that doesn't put me at such a disadvantage? And incidentally, this kind of bargaining with people is entirely okay. Um, it's a fair request. And so he said, well, maybe can you give me some good reason that God exists? Okay, well, that was much better. I said, yeah, I think I can do that, okay? But I have to ask you a few questions first. Now, what do I need to know before I go forward in this conversation with this guy? I need to know a good reason that God exists, right? When I know the good reason God exists, I know the steps that get me there. 
Then I'm going to try to have him help me by affirming the steps, put the pieces in place before I kind of get to the, to the punchline, so to speak. All right? So here's the question I asked him. First one, I said, and in these, these questions I told him are kind of simple, but just bear with me. Do you think that things exist? <laughs> he said, yeah, things exist. Okay, things exist. We both agree with that. Okay, here was my second question. Do you think that the things that exist have always existed? Or did they come into existence at some point of time? Now he said, no, they haven't always existed. And there's hardly anybody around anymore uh, that's thought about this very much that thinks the universe is eternal, all right? That's a dead and gone idea. Uh, and partly because of the force of Big Bang cosmology. So again, I think this is something that some Christians are uncomfortable with. But just keep in mind, that's what they believe. So let's just, just work with that. We can use it to our advantage. No, he said, I think that things came into existence at some point in time. Big Bang, fine. I agree with you, I said. Okay, fine. So we're both in agreement about these two things on the table. Now the third question, I said to him, and this is the one that really matters. All those things that came into existence, what caused them to come into existence? <coughs> and there he paused for a moment. And some people will say, well, look, at I, what do I know? I'm not a scientist. I'm not a who, who, who am I to say? And I say, wait a minute, it's not really that hard. It's simple. There are only two possibilities. Either something caused the universe to come into existence or no thing caused the universe to come into existence. It's just that simple. There are no other alternatives. Either something or no thing. What say you? Okay, now, for me as a questioner, I'm in a very, very good spot because I have moved him with information he's given me to a point where now he has to make a decision and he's stuck because he doesn't want to say that something caused the universe because the minute he says something caused the universe, it would have to be something that is outside of the universe. You see that, right? Outside of the space-time continuum. Not something natural, but something at least supranatural, maybe supernatural. And that immediately... Um, uh, is an assault on his maybe atheistic, materialistic point of view. He didn't want to go there. And also it would have to be not just something outside of the material universe, but something that's really powerful and probably really smart and probably personal, and there are other reasons for that. And before long, you can see we're getting pretty close to the G word here. This is starting to sound like God caused the universe. Now, he didn't want to go there. All right, fine. Then what is your only other alternative? And notice how I'm prosecuting this using questions. What is your only other alternative? Since you don't want to say something caused the universe, then you have to say that no thing caused the universe. But this is hard to say because that's worse than magic. <laughs> In magic, you have a magician who pulls a rabbit out of a hat. Here you have no hat, and you have no magician. You just have the rabbit, you know, the universe coming into existence. This is wildly counterintuitive. When a wife comes home from, the, uh, from, from work and sees this new Mercedes SL sitting in the garage, she asks her husband, honey, where'd that Mercedes come from? He said, I don't know, honey, it just popped into existence out of nothing for no reason. <laughs> If you were his wife, would you buy that? No, of course not. This is not reasonable. Now, maybe somebody might say, it's possible. Okay, I'm not going to argue with that. We're not trying to convince them that, uh, that our view is absolutely necessary that God exists and created the universe. We just want to show them that it's the odds on favorite. And that's what I'm doing here. Notice how I make this case, though. I'm using Columbo number three to make a point. The point is, in this case, that God exists. But I have to know the reason or some reasons why God exists. And I have to know how to work through that argument. And I use the questions to get as many pieces on the table as I can. And so let me give you another illustration. When you, deal with, when you deal with believers, particularly about things related to the Bible, there's a common idea that they have that goes something along the following lines. They'll say, well, you know, every translation is essentially the same. That there's no, 
There's, there's no differences. They, they, they all basically say the same thing. There's no substantive differences between them. And what, uh, you know, one is as good as the other. Okay? How many of you have heard something like this before? Okay? Well, the problem with that is, is it's not what? This is not true. Okay? It's just not true. Um, it's a convenient idea. It's repeating something somebody's told them. But the facts of the case don't, don't line up with that, right? So uh, one of the things that I've done in the past when I encounter somebody who says that is I'm like, okay, if, if you would, turn to Psalm 12, verse 6. <clears throat> the King James says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep what? Them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Okay? Well, how does a modern version read there in verse 7? I should have had my phone on me. I can do it quickly. We've done this before. Do you have a Bible program on that? I got mine, Sylvia. Thanks. So I'm going to switch. I'm going to switch over to the NIV, and I'm going to go to Psalm 12. All right. So verse six. The words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified, and a crucible like gold refined seven times. You, Lord, verse 7, you, Lord, will keep the needy safe and protect us from the wicked. Is that the same? Now look, this is one of the main verses that folks who believe in preservation, Psalm 12, 6, and 7, this is one of the main texts for preservation of the Word of God, right? So you can come to this verse... And you don't have to be using this verse to necessarily go all the way and make the point regarding preservation. But is this an excellent verse to use to say that the two different things don't say the same thing? I mean, it's obvious that they don't say the same thing, that they don't mean the same thing. So what does that do then to the myth that they have in their mind that they all mean the same thing and it's just one is just as good as another? Well, if they're honest, are they going to be able to maintain that view anymore? In my estimation, the answer is what? No. Okay, and we're not even getting into yet, you know, uh, how does this preservation work? How did God do it? And so on and so forth. All the things that we studied when we, when we went through that topic uh, not long ago, right? But the questioning process of trying to draw that out of them and get them to see that on their own is a more, uh, getting them to affirm that piece that there's something there. Now, that would be putting a big stone in somebody's shoe. Because now they're going to have to really think that through in a, in a very serious and profound way. okay? Because it really challenges the idea that nah, they're, they're all the same. They're just all essentially different ways of saying the same thing. That's not the case. okay? So we're kind of running out of time here a little bit. Um, in the curriculum booklet that goes with the video, I want to end with uh, kind of sharing a few of these things with you. He says, sometimes the best way to disagree with somebody is, is not to face the issue head on, but to use an indirect approach. Okay? So, let's say Ernie comes in here and he, he says to me that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. He's never said that, okay? Just so, you, <laughs> just so you're wondering. I don't agree. I don't agree with that. I'm sure, most of you don't either, right? Okay. I don't agree with the assertion that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. I could say, Ernie, that is that is ridiculous. That's crazy. That's false. That's wrong. How could you be so, you know, uh, ill-informed or you know something along those lines, and take a sort of real direct, straight-line approach to dealing with that? Right. That's probably going to do what immediately to Ernie. At that point, is Ernie listening to, any, to anything I'm saying after that? Okay, so he he says Kukul says in the in the material he material here he says offer an alternative and invite a principled response. So here's some suggestions. Number one, let me suggest an alternative view, and tell me if it's an improvement. Then you can tell me. Then you can tell me why, why you think your alternative is better. 
Can I still get to the same thing? But in a different way. Another one. Whatever the topic. I wouldn't characterize it that way. Here's what I think may be a better or more accurate way to look at it. What do you think? Third. Have you ever thought about or considered another alternative? These are a lot more polite ways of telling somebody that you think they're what? Wrong. Wrong without taking a Bible and whacking them over the head with it or something like that. Okay. Number five. I don't think that's going to work and here's why. Six. I'm not sure I agree with, I'm not sure I agree with the way you put it. Have you ever considered this as an alternative? So there, there, there you're, still in the, the, you're still in the questioning, sort of the Colombo mentality or mindset there as you, as you think about those questions, okay? So I think what I'm going to do here for the sake of time is we're going we're gonna to stop. Does anybody have any questions or comments about it? Now, I, want, I also wanted to stop because where he's going to end with this is kind of with some of the issues that Nate brought up a few weeks back. And those being, what do you do when somebody, what do you do when somebody is using this approach against you? Right? In other words, they, get, they realize what you're doing, they become wise to the tactical approach that you're using with them. What do you, how do you respond to that? How do you deal with that in, in the middle of the conversation? That's what he's going to talk about in the second half of this video from session three. Okay? And we'll probably have time to get to that next week. Does anybody have any questions or comments? about anything that we went over today. No? Okay, well, I, I hope that you're finding this beneficial. I hope that you're finding this interesting and helpful. And um, like I said, I read this book in 2009 when it came out, and I've been um, sort of using this approach in my personal life for quite beneficial okay as far as negotiating and navigating through these these conversations with folks that can be sometimes difficult so I appreciate your attention and uh, we'll continue with this next time <laughs>